were signs of life detected on a planet 124 light years away? Maybe. The question of whether or not we're alone in the universe has been one asked since we first saw stars. And while life could look somewhat like us or completely different, there are certain signs that would alert us that someone is out there. So is a recent analysis on K218b one of them? I'm Ashley Christine and here's how it works. There are multiple ways that life could be discovered. They could come to us, we could go to them. They could send us a signal, or we could find something that is not part of the normal happenings of space. Ideally, a signal would be sent to us. That would give us distance and time to digest the information before they may or may not arrive. Kind of like the Netflix series, The Three Body Problem, where nerds happen to be supermodels. A signal would probably be pretty easy to confirm. Stars are transmitting the entire electromagnetic spectrum, things like radio waves and microwaves, but they don't transmit signals like like Shakespeare's Hamlet. So intelligent life going about their business or trying to communicate with us would stick out. It gets a bit trickier when it's not a signal, but a scan of an atmosphere's composition. Last year, the James Webb Telescope detected possible biosignature signs in the atmosphere of an exoplanet called K218b. And researchers have been investigating it ever since. Named after NASA's second administrator, James Edwin Webb, the James Webb Telescope is the largest and most powerful space telescope humanity has ever built. If we discover an exoplanet that could support life, this would probably be the thing that does it. There are a lot of different sizes and types of telescopes. You have the kind that you build or give to your kid for their eighth birthday. There are ground-based telescopes like FAST in China, which is a radio telescope, so they detect or amplify radio signals. There are also ground-based telescopes like the GTC in Spain, which is an optical and infrared telescope, so it takes the kind of pictures that you're used to seeing or creepy ones like these. <laughs> for this video, we'll be focusing on space telescopes, specifically the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb, both of which are in space. Launched in 1990, Hubble is in orbit around Earth. And thank God too, because when it first launched, the primary mirror had the wrong curve and it was sending back these blurry images. But since Hubble is in orbit around Earth, astronauts were able to get to it and repair it. The James Webb, on the other hand, is about 1.5 million miles away in orbit around the sun. This location is called L2 or Lagrange Point 2. There are five Lagrange points in total, which are stable gravitational points between two bodies in space. I could make a whole video on Lagrange points, but basically think of these gravitational lines as wind lines, where there is less activity in these open sections here, so a more stable point in space. This is ideal for the James Webb because then we don't have to burn a ton of fuel trying to keep it in orbit. It stays mostly locked there on its own. Hubble and James Webb work together because they're both designed to peer deeper into space without the obstruction of Earth's atmosphere to get in the way. Hubble focuses more on ultraviolet and visible light and a bit of infrared, while the James Webb focuses on visible, near-infrared, and mid-infrared. This is important because infrared has longer wavelengths, and so it can penetrate dense clouds and dust in a way that Hubble can't. Infrared is also helpful when analyzing exoplanets because molecules at those wavelengths are more prominent, and each molecule has a light signature unique to it, kind of like a fingerprint. The James Webb is equipped with multiple spectrographs to isolate it, which work kind of like a prism where light is split up so that we can analyze different wavelengths. This equipment can get really into the nitty gritty. NearSpec, which is one of four scientific instruments aboard the James Webb, has an array of these tiny windows called micro shutters. Each window can be individually controlled to allow only a specific part of the light spectrum to pass through. And there are about 250,000 of these windows. This allows us to target very specific sections and detect even the slightest variations in wavelengths. Remember that we can't just see down onto the surface of these planets. We don't have that kind of technology. They're just too far away. The easiest way for us to determine the atmospheric composition is to analyze the light of its star and compare that to how light is reflected or absorbed by the planet. And fortunately, light provides quite a lot of information. One technique we use is called the transit method. An exoplanet will orbit in front of its star and that light passes through the planet's atmosphere. Some of the spectrum is absorbed by the atmosphere and some of it is not. For example, nitrogen will absorb different wavelengths than sodium. So if there's sodium in the atmosphere, there will be what's called an absorption line in the spectrum where the sodium should be, but it's not there because the sodium absorbed that wavelength. So sodium is in the atmosphere. The James Webb can also analyze how light reflects off the planet when it's more off to the side, 
which can help us determine the atmosphere's density and temperature. All of this equips the James Webb Telescope with the capacity to detect pollutants, so signs of industry, along with artificial light, like city lights or illumination not from a star. Scientists aren't expecting to find these things, but the James Webb is equipped to identify them if they exist. First discovered in 2015 by the Hubble Telescope at about 124 light years away is a star called K218. This is an M-type star or red dwarf, the most common type of star we find in our galaxy. These are much cooler and dimmer than our sun and expected to live much longer since they don't burn through fuel as quickly. K218 has two planets orbiting it, K218c and K218b. I know the names are boring, but when you have like 10,000 plus stars you got a name, you have to deviate from the Roman and Greek gods at some point. <laughs> K218c is far too close to its star to allow life. It'd be way too hot. And yes, planets orbiting red dwarfs can be closer to the stars because they're cooler and not as bright, but K218c's orbit is nine days, which is absolutely insane. For reference, Mercury's is 88 days, and look how close it is. <laughs> I know instinctually you wanna say, well, well, maybe life isn't the same everywhere else. Maybe it's just different. When it comes to biological composition and personality, that's probably true, but there needs to be an environment that allows chemical reactions of some kind to occur so that something can be made. And a planet getting incinerated by radiation and temperatures that can melt lead is probably not one of them. K218b, on the other hand, is within the habitable zone or Goldilocks zone and receives almost the same amount of solar radiation as Earth does. So like us, it's close enough to its star to allow liquid water, but not too much to be incinerated. Liquid water is an important sign because of its versatility and supporting character qualities for building all different types of life. It is a literal lubricant in chemical reactions. Finding it is a really good sign. We have kind of veered away from depending on the habitable zone of stars in recent years. They provide a good baseline in the search for life, but as we've discovered from our own solar system, liquid water can be outside the borders of the habitable zone. Saturn's moon Enceladus has a salty ocean beneath 15 miles of ice, or 24 kilometers, and Jupiter's moon Europa is believed to contain twice as much water as our oceans. So there are more options for warm liquid water than just what's on the surface. Obviously, we prefer to find water on the surface rather than inside the dark Lovecraftian nightmare of a frozen moon, but a habitable zone is still a good starting point. K218b is almost nine times the mass of Earth and nearly three times the width, but the coolest part about it is that it might be a Hycean planet. A Hycean planet is a water world, somewhere between between the mass of Earth and Neptune, but a hydrogen-rich atmosphere instead of the nitrogen-rich atmosphere that we have here on Earth. This is not a place we could breathe, but it wouldn't be absolutely terrible. Our solar system does not have a high sea and planet. We have four terrestrial planets or rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and four gas giants. So it might be kind of weird to think about a hybrid between them, but Hycean planets are thought to be very common in the rest of the galaxy and one of the better candidates for life. They are, however, theoretical because they're difficult to confirm and unlike anything that we have in our own solar system. K218b might be very similar to Earth, but it's not a place we can explore the surface of, it's just too far away. Even at the speed of light, it would take us 124 years to reach it. With current technology, two million years. And this is one of the closer locations. So even if we found something, we won't be able to physically go there and demand they give us all their gold. Last year, using the transit method, the James Webb conducted a study of K218b and discovered carbon dioxide and methane, which are good signs on their own, but also a hint of dimethyl sulfide. Dimethyl sulfide, or DMS, is the dominant volatile organic sulfur in global oceans. So it's a fart. DMS is a pretty common gas produced by marine bacteria, some algae, but mostly phytoplankton, and plays an important role in the sulfur cycle on Earth. That may not sound like much, but DMS emissions have a pretty important cooling effect on our planet and can modify cloud properties, which in turn impacts climate. As far as we know, DMS can only be made by life forms. So finding it on another planet has everyone pretty excited, but there are a few issues. For one, the biggest is that the DMS signal received by the James Webb was extremely faint and only showed up sometimes. Second, DMS disappears pretty quickly in Earth's atmosphere, which makes it difficult to lock on and detect. In order to reach detectable levels from this distance, 
life on K2-18B would need to crank out 20 times more of the DMS than it does here. That's a lot of farts. On its own, not a deal breaker. But the other problem is that the James Webb may not be able to separate a DMS signature from methane. Fortunately, there is an instrument on board the James Webb better equipped to separate these signatures, and that's the mid-infrared instrument. Follow-up observations with it are scheduled for later this year, so hopefully we will have a better answer by then. Look, we all want this to be true, probably, no? Yes, but for now we need to manage expectations and wait for further analysis. <laughs>